much appreciated. Um, so we don't have any rain during the, during the lecture. Um, I'm very happy uh, to have the privilege tonight to introduce Alexander Eisenschmidt uh, to the AA. Um, Alexander is a designer, a theorist, and a professor, uh, currently at the University of Illinois um, of Chicago. He previously taught at Syracuse University uh, School of Architecture in upstate New York, as well as Pratt Institute in Manhattan, uh, where he received his master's. Um, he also received a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, um, where his uh, research sort of looks at a productive tension between architectural form and the modern city. Um, he is the author <coughs> and editor of uh, this book I'm holding right now called Chicagoisms, um, The City as Catalyst for Architectural Speculation. And there's a stand in the back um, if you'd like to uh, purchase it. Um, so this book uh, is a collection of essays by Alexander, uh, amongst others, Brett Steele, uh, Sam Jacob uh, from the AA, of course, um, but also Winnie Moss, uh, Sylvia Lavin, and many, many more. Um, it looks at Chicago as a case study um, with the attempt to sort of uh, relook at it or reposition uh, Chicago as a very important role uh, in architectural and urban history. Uh, it looks at the concept of city as idea uh, as an intellectual or physical phenomenon. Um, and also as the city of Chicago as an as a incubator, a very uh, important site of possibility and a launching pad uh, for urban and architectural imaginings. Um, quite interestingly, it looks at a very mo a specific moment in time, um, in 1871 of the Great Fire, which I'm sure Alexander will discuss, uh, where the fire wiped out large portions of the city uh, and there was a massive and very rapid rebuild. Um, so this was uh, brought on by, this also uh, came to the issue of a lack of precedent, uh, which allowed the architects of the time during the great rebuild of Chicago uh, to generate projects from existing conditions of the city uh, rather than architectural precedent. Um, and this allowed for a great spring for springboard for architectural experimentation. Um, and this sort of attitude uh, I think can be seen in the ethos of Alexander's uh, practice um, called Studio Offshore. Um, it's a practice um, that works at multiple scales from that of furniture uh, to um, all the way to the urban or to the city. Um, it sort of challenges conventional modes of practice by being a network practice. Um, but the ethos itself in terms of architectural experimentation um, has a call uh, for architecture to act. Um, for the architecture proposals to detour, detour our normal routines uh, and to promote uh, alternatives. Um, so I think this can be quite seen in the, uh, the readings and the essays uh, that I, I read uh, within this book. Um, and hopefully uh, Alexander will talk about his practice uh, in, in that way as well. Um, and um, to make a link between this book uh, and Alexander's work uh, and where we are right now, uh, there's an essay by Igor uh, Marinovic um, on uh, our very own Alvin Boyarsky. Um, prior to coming to the AA and revolutionizing the school, um, Alvin spent a great deal of time in the 60s in Chicago. Um, and it had an endearing effect, effect on him and, his, uh, uh, and what he eventually came and did to the school. There was a certain verve and potency to Chicago um, and the architectural sort of uh, uh, projects and urban um, sch uh, schemes within the city uh, that resonated with him. And this sort of idea of vir uh, vir virtu uh, virtuality uh, and dynamism uh, was something that he carried with him over uh, the Atlantic Ocean and to the AA, uh, where he has, of course, revolutionized our school. Um, and that same kind of attitude and architectural experimentation that we, that we see in Chicago uh, was, was generated uh, and brought back to the AA, most um, notable under the AA um, unit system. Um, so with that link from Chicagoisms and that essay um, to the AA and Alvin, uh, I would like to uh, introduce and welcome uh, Alexander to the AA. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this uh, this kind introduction. It's 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 really great to be here, and and the introduction really um, 
I can I, I can sort of skip the first five minutes where we're uh, trying to outline the uh, the book and the many contributors who did this um, really eloquently. I will. The one thing um, I will not talk about my design practice. Instead, I will use the histories that I'm talking about as a kind of projectile uh, for the present. So in a way, even though th the hope is that I uh, will give you the feeling of, of, of these histories being quite um, productive for today, um, this is the attempt and you will let me know if this actually works. So I've entitled my talk, Chicago as Export uh, of Metropolitan Architecture. And you also realize that um, Right now, I'm, I'm changing the, the, the isms to ism as a kind of uh, suggesting that um, um, that Chicago, um, um, the Chicago ism is in, in, in um, a kind of um, theory of, of a city to be uh, uh, productive for the for the here and now, and I will unpack this um, hopefully by the by the end of the lecture. Um, so it's a collection of essays. I did this with a colleague uh, of mine at UIC, uh, art historian called Jonathan Kinder. Um, and um, um, for the purpose of, of this lecture today, I want to focus on one um, um, discourse that surrounded the search for a metropolitan architecture, uh, which was also uh, the basis of my essay in, in the publication of one of the essays that I did. Um, and it, it was a search, the search for metropolitan architecture um, that first began to formulate in a, in a transatlantic uh, exchange between uh, Chicago and Berlin. Um, as I see it, was then um, channeled to sociologists and critics in, in, in Germany and then resonated in ideas uh, of an urban architecture that would populate later generations from Ludwig Hildesheimer's Großstadt architecture to uh, Großstadt architecture or metropolitan architecture um, to, of course, the office of, of metropolitan or for metropolitan architecture. Um, and I want to start with this map um, uh, from 1870. Um, it's a map that the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Railroad put out. Um, and it shows one route um, of, of, of many um, um, of that railroad and steamer around the world. Um, it's, um, and, and it, it also, it's, it's a kind of advertisement, of course, of, of that company, but also of Chicago as kind of a global metropolis simultaneously situated in the Midwestern plains of the US. Um, and let's face it, that's in the middle of nowhere. Um, really, and uh, but at the same time, on route um, around the globe, and so it's a map uh, uh, to some extent. This I, I see kind of emblematic in that it's it foreshadows a new attitude within the city that increasingly sees itself as the center of, of a kind of metropolitan. Um, to me, this was also always a kind of conceptual anchor to think of of the the, the book project, and and this kind of at the center of this metropolitan world by 1870 is maybe not entirely unfounded. Um, it's a city that in the early 19th century existed only as a frontier village with a few settlers, but by 1870 materialized as one of the largest markets supported by the world's most active railroad junction and one of the most important ports in the world. And so by 1890, its population had long passed its, its one million mark, uh, sprawled over 180 square miles, making the city the largest footprint in the world. And so this ultimately created a state of perpetual crisis, um, provoked by a certain density, pollution, uh, and also the, which came along with the locale of the city itself. So reading this contemporary reading contemporary accounts, one realizes that observers uh, saw um, Chicago always with a simultaneous horror and fascination. They were always frightened by what happened around them, um, and, but at the same time, they were really fascinated by it. Um, uh, it always seemed to simultaneously head towards, towards disaster, but under this pressure, there seems to then always be a kind of outpacing of, of progress. So for, for most observers, 
the city's development was not simply a kind of result of 19th century pressures, as was the kind of conception, conceptual framework to understand the emerging metropolis at the time, but instead a, a kind of understanding uh, Chicago as a forecast of the new century. One could say that here the future had arrived in the present or outrun the past. Uh, several projects come to mind that maybe illustrate that mentality. First, maybe the reversal of the river. Some of you might know where the city had always um, discharged its river water into the lake, um, and uh, but sanitation became a problem and the river carried polluted water that would spill into the lake from which Chicago got its drinking water. And so reversing the flow made Lake Michigan the river source and solved one problem. Um, you know, it, it became a problem downstream. Um, but not no longer for Chicago, and so the city became known as the city that made its river run uphill. It, it often made headlines as a city that questioned gravity as it sought to challenge the Eiffel Tower with the invention of the first Ferris wheel for the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893, making very clear the, the kind of the mentality within the city that was dedicated to technology, and there was a seemingly a, a, a real willingness to stage experiments and it's also the city that had to battle with a constant with constant flooding and notoriously muddy streets until it raised its entire ground plane in only two decades in order to be above the level of lake michigan so it's a city that lifted itself out of the mud uh, as a, a german bautzeit the, the german bautzeit in reports in 1868 so built by an average of 10 feet, um, uh, eventually was perfected. And as you can see here in this illustration, the, the shops actually stayed open. Um, and this was sort of an attraction and the, and the city fully embraced this, uh, again with postcards and, and, and really making uh, technology a, a kind of spectacle. Um, uh, and possibly the, the most vibrant description of this urban climate that I'm trying to uh, to elaborate on comes from Louis Sullivan, who in 1901 notes, the city is young, clumsy, foolish. Its architecture sins are unstable, captious, and fleetish. It can pull itself down and rebuild itself in a generation. It has done and can do great things, and the mood is on. One must indeed be, and now it comes, incurably optimistic, even momentarily to dream such a dream. So I was right. The, the, the qualities that Sullivan attributes to the city are not entirely flattering, uh, referring to the foolishness of architecture ambitions, and yet he's in exactly those kind of attributes a way to overcome preconceptions. And for him, the prerequisite for dreaming foolish dreams, uh, kind of the essence maybe, uh, um, and I would uh, endorse this, uh, uh, for the practice of architecture, lies for Sullivan in, in the, the optimistic. Uh, it's a kind of, a kind of a, a really, I think, a, a productive way. To, and we see that kind of, and maybe the only way, and we see that optimism in, in the urban and architecture adventures that I was just showing. More striking is that optimism at the sociocultural level when much of the city was destroyed, as was already mentioned, in, in 1870. And, and the Chicago Tribune shortly after noted that at the, that the city, quote, the city was set forward 10 years by the fire. So even in the popular discourse, there was an understanding that crisis can provoke innovation and that in the end, optimism might trump planning. So with this almost unconditional commitment, dedication to technology and a willingness to stage experiments, Chicago became for many cities and officials a, 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 a model to study. The city had emerged as a kind of metropolitan uh, forerunner where its rapid development as a, as a modern city became more and more anticipated for the future. Um, so city officials, sociologists, architects, you name it, began to look at Chicago in order to better understand the metropolitan fate of their own cities. And, and Berliners were particularly receptive to images of the American city, which, which might have something to do with uh, a, a shared history. Uh, in the same year in which the Chicago fire um, raged, the, the, the city of Berlin became the capital of, of the, the German Empire. Uh, 1871 was the year in which both cities were catapulted into modern uh, limelight, in the, into the modern limelight. And so the fire inspired a, a building code 
that in combination with advances in steel frames and the inventions of the, of the safety elevator, um, uh, buildings that surrounded entire building blocks of the downtown grid. And on the other side, Berlin's emergence as the capital of the Second German Empire uh, shifted the, the political and uh, economic landscape of, uh, but also, uh, also Europe, um, where the incorporations of the different uh, north and, and southwest were, were um, uh, taking place at speed. But whereas most Chicagoans really wholeheartedly embraced the, their kind of involuntary uh, new beginning, i.e. the fire, uh, really uh, observed that sudden change from provincialism to international standards, real suspicion, ultimately looking at Chicago became a way for them. And so from, because it was a city that similarly, uh, though much, uh, quite a bit later, uh, it developed uh, its kind of metropolitan qualities, if, which really from, from 1871 to 1895, the population of Berlin doubled to 1.6 million, and this influx uh, that really um, uh, couldn't, met, wasn't matched by the construction effort, and resulting in a population density that reached its all-time high in 1900, when an average of 30,000 people lived on one square kilometer. Just a, a comparison, today London has, has a, a density of 5,000. So the city experienced enormous urban pressures, and in this climate, um, uh, it was in this climate that disciplines like Städtebau, and I'm illustrating this here with uh, one of the most, I guess, important uh, Städtebau treaties um, uh, at the time, um, where um, uh, this, this discipline was formed um, and uh, in a struggle to really, uh, to find scientific rules for the study of reorganization of, of a rapidly expanding city. And, and planners, um, and this kind of the uh, Reinhard Baumeister, the, the, the planner um, um, that I'm, I'm showing at the, the front page um, of, of his book, uh, first sponsored a unified building law for, for the German Empire in 1871 and then published this book, City Expansion in Relation to Technology, Building Policy and Economy. And what, what traumatized, and it's also somewhat emblematic when you listen to this title, what traumatized planners and common Berliners alike was that the city had not only changed dramatically, but had also become unrecognizable through the implementation of new urban forms, means of mobility, and a new demographic diversity that with an increased number of foreigners. So not only were they highly skeptical of the formlessness of the modern metropolis, they were also skeptical of of the cosmopolitanism that was, was happening in, at the time, so quite conservative. Um, of course, what Berliners lamented was already a, a reality in Chicago, where the center business district that I'm showing here on the, on the right-hand side um, um, really was uh, regarded as the strongest expression of economic pressures and a kind of dismissal of art and tradition and the embrace of, of technological developments. Uh, and I'm here showing an image, of course, on the left is Potsdamer Platz, um, um, and you might just remember for later on, uh, this is the Wertheim Warenhaus that was, um, yeah, sort of between those, uh, um, those two buildings that are in the foreground. Um, and, uh, and on the right you have um, uh, an intersection in the loop, uh, the, the kind of business district in, in, in Chicago. And I'm showing this image because it, um, it's, it's at a moment where city officials tested if traffic could still self-regulate, if police present and, and traffic regulation was suspended for only five minutes. The answer is it couldn't. Uh, quite obvious, um, and but for me, it's it's really emblematic for a city that that truly used um, uh, its urban um, terrain as a laboratory where conditions uh, like traffic jams could be tested, and at the same time, this image also becomes then a, p a postcard that um, advertises the city's sort of pulsating life. So a full, really a full embrace of of, of that mentality. Uh, and so while all this is, uh, uh, was common to the metropolis in the US, it appeared really threatening 
uh, to the German capital to cite one reference from a widely read uh, text by the conservative historian Julius Langbein. Um, uh, the capital, Berlin that is, grew in the first century at such a rate only comparable to the cities of North America, and of course you have Chicago in mind. For him, Berlin was a really odd city um, uh, in, in that it embraced modernity and accepted somehow, it accepted American influences as he saw it. So Berlin was seen as the epitome of what was then called Americanization. Uh, by the way, this is, this, is, this is a term coined by a British journalist, a uh, uh, kind of political activist, William Thomas Stead in 1901. And so while the, 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 the general use of the term Americanization was dominated by stereotypes that described the American city as, as trivial and, and without tradition um, and, and without history, the often cited connections and comparisons between uh, Berlin and Chicago would prove particularly productive uh, as they enabled a, a repositioning of the city's failings. Uh, one such productive reworking of Berlin's problems to Chicago's modernism was, was Walter Rathenau's ironically titled essay, The Most Beautiful City in the World, um, uh, talking about Berlin. And of course, he was deeply ironic about this because ar he argued that uh, modern Berlin did not grow up but transform. Um, and by doing so, Rathenau suggested that the city had not organically evolved over time, but rapidly mutated into a construct similar to North American cities driven by modern forces of mechanization and, and um, population growth. And so the essay really tried harsh criticism of matter-of-fact urbanity, architecture, and culture with a, a real determined affection towards progress. And so Rata kind of product of the modern metropolis summarized Berlin's situation with the now famous words, Athens on the River Spree is dead. This is, the, the Ber this is how Berlin was often viewed, right? It was sort of called the Athens on, on the River Spree. Uh, this w city is dead and the um, on the River Spree is rising. Now, a new city had emerged that no longer conformed to traditional European conventions and, and Chicago um, became the, the kind of comparative grasping the city's development that otherwise remained mysterious. Even visitors, us, and here we have Mark Twain, were compelled to relate the two cities. Um, and, and for him, Berlin had disappeared and re-emerged as a European Chicago. And for, for Rathenau and Twain, utilizing Chicago uh, produced not only a different understanding of Berlin, but a different kind of city altogether, I would argue. And evidence for all this uh, uh, comes here in the form of, uh, of an artifact, an, a map uh, uh, that German tourists had when, when traveling to Chicago. Um, they, uh, it's, it's a compounded uh, kind of American Berlin that was created uh, uh, as I read this map as a kind of comparison between the two cities, also in terms of its scale. And, and so this kind of cartographic visualization of this compound Berlin was created for travelers in, the, in, uh, in 1900, where maps of Chicago with a comparative map of Berlin was a kind of constant reminder to tourist cities' intimate relationship. And so reading Rathenau and Twain's assessment of the city in reference to artifacts like this one, hints um, on the construction of an alternative uh, metropolis, one no longer solely driven by history, culture, um, and maybe the, the conventional understanding of how uh, a city is, is formed over time, but instead by the acceleration of metropolitan forces in the present. So ultimately, they, they turned up the volume on aspects commonly associated that as challenges of, of, uh, to the urban and architectural culture, right? Uh, so a real reworking of, of, of the way that, um, uh, that architecture and urbanism could work. And ultimately, this comes out in, uh, in the way that then also formulations of metropolitan architecture come about. So here, the laboratory of the American metropolis enables a kind of visualization of an acceler accelerated urbanism that forecasted Berlin's very own metropolitan traits. 
Only a few years later, this hybrid urbanism was further understood by um, a few German intellectuals that traveled to the US in 1904 as, as delegates of uh, the Congress of Arts and Science that was organized in conjunction with the World Exposition in St. Louis. And among them were you know, very famous Werner Sombart, Ferdinand Tönnies, and Max Weber, um, uh, important at the time, who, who were deeply invested in questions concerning the modern city. And they used the journey or voyage um, as a way to, or as a great opportunity to visit this, the land of the metropolis as they, as they called the US. And so should be important for them, the most, uh, they, they always point out that this was the most important visited during, during their travels. Uh, it was defined by these figures, Echo American City and the Ur Metropolis, the original. The former somewhat associates with the grid that made expansion possible and were infrastructure for urban exports, while the latter was achieved through the city's lack of history, as he called it. What he only began to understand, local architects with already embraced, or they were living it, right? Uh, so you have John Rood of Ermond Rood um, uh, speaking uh, during a lecture of an America that is of tradition. Um, our freedom begets license, it's true. We do shock these works of architecture irredeemably bad. We try that result in disaster, yet somehow in this mass of ungoverned energy lies the principle. So for Rood, the lack of history, and even though this is because, of course, America or the U.S. did not lack history. It, it was cancelled out by, by, by settlers. But in terms of productivity for the architect was emerging by thinking of a, a blank slate um, um, that, um, and, and that for him a degree of freedom that encouraged the suspension of established norms and conditions. So as such, Chicago became the perfect testing grounds for crude architectural experiments. It became a model city that feared no past and, and maybe therefore also no could do these reversals of the river and so on until they actually uh, finalized. Um, and in the persona of Rude, the is that here uh, the kind of utopian dreamer, uh, the speculative architect meets the problem solver, uh, the, 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 the one that sees it only loaded with problems that one needs to solve. And, and I really think those exist today, uh, maybe even more so than back in the day. But um, this is the kind of combination of the utopian, uh, here it, he meets the, the, and the problem solver promoting a kind of visionary pragmatist, as I would like to call it, that I think is a really productive figure uh, even for today. Chicago, in this case, in Root's case, taking Chicago as a laboratory for modernity, even more importantly, um, a, a zone in which artistic stylistic could be good. And therefore, this note also meant to call on architects to no longer rely on historic precedents, but to use the conditioned city, so what is found, what is there, um, as a springboard for architecture. And, and you know, to give you a few examples, the sheer height of, of the Chicago Masonic Temple, for example, um, that in a way suggests two kinds of cities, the existing one and the one that sort of emerged through the pressures of the grid and the requirements of, of the program inside, uh, as well as the simplicity and monumentality of uh, the Manatnok building from 1892, might be the clearest articulation of an architecture that was less bound by historical tropes and instead driven by the forces of the metropolis, right? And so I'm, I'm here not only thinking of, of, of the lack of ornamentation, uh, the punched windows, the kind of aggressiveness of the structure, uh, the regularity uh, of the way that the, 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 that the facade works, but also in the mentality when, when Root, for example, came back to see that uh, drawing um, in discussion with a client to see the drawing by a draftsman entirely stripped of its ornamentation, he stepped back and realized that he had created a monster, that, that this was totally unexpected and that he couldn't, he couldn't really understand what was happening and was, was uh, as in his own terms, was frightened by, by this thing. Um, he never called it a monster, but I think that's a way how we have to sort of think of that reaction, and it's a reaction that comes back um, in, in, in later generations of metropolitan architects. And forces, right, forces are like the, the density of the grid 
um, 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 and the, the, the kind of new programs that suddenly buildings had to include in combination um, um, as well as the pressures of new infrastructures that multiplied, um, illustrated here on the right, multiplied the levels of the city and carved new spaces into the metropolis. Now, it, it, it's clear that, Chica that the Chicago school really knew that they, or they felt that, that their work was deeply related to, to the metropolis, but it, it would take a German colleague to, to formulate an early definition of metropolitan architecture. It's almost as if, right, because sh Chicago uh, was, was there, was a kind of given, um, whereas in, in Germany it wasn't existing, but they realized something was happening to their city. But they actually needed to formulate a kind of uh, theory. So Karl Scheffler is, is, is the person that I'm mo probably introducing to, to um, a, a Berlin-based theorist and, and kind of urban critic uh, constructed in 1904, very early, uh, an architecture as something that had to be born from within the metropolis. So for him, the modern city had brought about spatial organization tensions and material conditions that had to be understood as emergent architectural paradigms. And so for him, uh, these kind of urban architecture, um, influenced by Tönnies' and Zombard's uh, analysis of Chicago without history, Treffler spoke of Berlin as the most American of all European cities and even as the capital of all modern ugliness. Um, lacked history, that lacked urban form, that lacked cultural coherence, and so in the city. It was all bad, except that in, in that very moment of crisis, there, for him, there was a kind of, wait, it's this dualism in, in the work is almost by the, uh, so we, we got that bad, somehow rethink um, this, 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 this mess to make sense of it. And he started something entirely different from the Städtebau discourse. He did not develop scientific rules to reorganize the city. In fact, he found in the of, of the contemporary city productivities. So we have here, and, and then Schaeffler in 1910 eventually coins the term for metropolitan architecture um, that he saw in this, right, a, a train uh, um, piercing through a housing block that so far had totally gone unnoticed by, by architects. They, they, they didn't even think that this is architecture, and Schaeffler sort of came along and, and rethought that. Here, um, the, the, the earliest iteration, or possibly the earliest iteration, architecture and architecture that was identifiable as emerging solely from within the culture of the metropolis, at, at least that's how the story goes, and systems, population search, uh, and infrastructural pressures. And so while Scheffler was troubled by these tendencies, he also acknowledged an inventiveness uh, that um, came with it. He notes, it's no accident that at the moment when the inherent organization of the metropolis is propelled on me, a new form of metropolitan architecture emerges. And so by taking reference from metropolises in the, in the US, Scheffler began to see potential in Berlin's seemingly undesigned and matter of fact sites within the city and by, by, by not conforming to conventions of, of urban and architectural form, these locations would become the very vestige in which architectural paradigms were able to develop. So here, architectural in, in spite of the formlessness of, of the modern city, but because uh, the urban formlessness created Spielraum, and this is a term he uses, play room to play um, for unlimited possibilities. So in this first iteration of a metropolitan architecture, we have already the DNA uh, of a metropolitan architecture that would captivate later. Um, and, and so what, what Scheffler started to do um, at this moment was to identify urban tropes um, uh, that highlighted uh, the kind of architectural intelligences. He, he was obsessed with the uniformity of ap apartment buildings under construction that had not yet been uh, adorned by ornamentation. He, he somehow was intrigued by the, the rawness uh, uh, of these structures, um, the straightforwardness of industrial warehouses that seemingly related only to needs of production and infrastructural <coughs> conditions, and the department store as a new building type giving expression to commodity culture. Um, what one could say that Scheffler 
that through Scheffler, these new forms were detected and described in such a way that they simultaneously approximated the formless city and the formative capacities of architecture. In, in essence, the, the anonymity of the metropolis within what Zimmel would call uh, objective culture had provoked uh, a new architecture. For, for Scheffler, this was most explicit in the Wertheim Bauernhaus expansion, um, uh, the, the kind of department store of 1906. In only two decades, uh, Wertheim added and assembled a collage of spaces and courtyards behind a regular facade uh, that wrapped the perimeter. And, and this continuous in interior could easily be misunderstood, um, and maybe rightly so, as a form of urbanism with streets, alleys, and plazas. Uh, and, and widely circulating textbooks on architecture took their cues from Wertheim, from the store, and went on to um, uh, to describe the department store by analogies uh, to traffic and pedestrian flow. Um, the department store should be able, they say, this is from this textbook, to accommodate large pedestrian traffic without congestion. And so the traditional boundaries between city uh, and interior were questioned through a new reading in which the interior essentially belonged now to the city. Uh, and so that the ether uh, in, of the metropolis had penetrated the interior of the urban block, letting a new kind of urbanism emerge, an urbanism of the interior, where the complexities of the city were um, captured in the interior spaces of the store and, and where movement, slow and fast, uh, was no longer to be limited to the crowded street, but was to enter the department store through the streams of consumers. And, and Messel s uh, seems to heighten this kind of spatial complexity by connecting the, the interior spaces with, with bridges that cross the courtyards at multiple levels, and so moments that cause historians like Julius Posner to, to talk uh, uh, when looking at this image in, in relation to uh, Piranesi's pottery. However, um, I, 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 I don't think actually that one needs to go back to history. Um, in fact, I think that uh, the, the kind of spatial elaborations um, um, uh, come from or project from the contemporary urbanity that surrounded the store. In fact, the delirium of the metropolis uh, brought about uh, by the acceleration of in, in all areas of urban life became here associated the experience of shopping, making a part of everyday life within what Simmel would call a fragment um, of the everyday. And so the shop wears the backdrop in which other programs were projected. It offered a rooftop garden for relaxation, a library, a turf, photo studio, I in essence, all things that the city would really cater to different types of metropolitan individuals in addition to the shop planner, the tourist, the employer, the individual, the detective, the collector, all somewhat new um, figures um, would, would feel very at home. Um, the Wertheim Emporium thus earned its position at the first address in travel guides um, where uh, they declared uh, Berlin for connoisseurs as one of those travel guides. When you arrive in Berlin, all visitors should go to Wertheim, to the, to the department store, where you can get, quote, a uh, taste of the tremendous world of city life. Uh, and so, right, it's the, the page. So you wouldn't go to, to Leipziger Platz or to, uh, to the um, Brandenburg Gate. Uh, you would go uh, to the department. Uh, this was the, the, the kind of where you would experience city life. So. Um, Wertheim was endorsed as the starting point for visitors, which signaled that it had surpassed, to some extent surpassed, the metropolis to condense urban experience. Here, traffic jams, light and sound effects tested, trends instigated, dreams s stimulated. And of course, was, was somewhat critical. I mean, he, was, he liked that uh, a mentality and that, that, sub so that somehow a contemporary culture was coming around, uh, but he was really skeptical of the ornamentation that still took place um, um, in the interior um, and to some extent on the exterior, and instead proposed that one should consider 
um, the hustle and bustle around the shopping counters as the ornament of the department store. So as shoppers uh, and sales personnel would roam between the displays of goods and the, at different speeds, these movement patterns alone uh, would be able to animate the space. And what happened here is a forecasting of uh, the fascination with movement patterns that figures uh, like Maholi Nash 15 years later clearly uh, shared, uh, but more importantly, uh, the transitory effects commonly associated with life of the modern city were now to facilitate the imagining of a new architectural interior of the metropolis, right? Um, so in a way, Maholi Nash sees this in, in the city, uh, but whereas Schaeffler already sort of sees those kinds of patterns in the, in the interior. But not only did the store reproduce the metropolis in the interior, it in turn also spilled back into the city through a facade with a, 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 with a new scale of transparency and reflectivity, um, opening the facade this kind of as a, as a almost, a, yeah, a, a glass surface created a large window into one could say both worlds, uh, but it also created a highly reflective surface that had an effect on the way the city was perceived. And so the nightly spectacle was advertised by, again, this very same travel guide who I instructed visitors to return to the scene in the evening, standing on in the tram, one would experience the incredible vision, they say, uh, offered by a mass of people in motion and lights and speeding vehicles. Uh, I'm arguing that here, the, the restless movement of Robert Mürze's Man, Money and Eigenschaften, or the man without quality, um, would um, engage Walter Ruttmann's Symphony of the Metropolis, of which this is a, a short excerpt or a clip from. And so the store's reflective glass facade, the illuminated interior, the movement of shoppers and vehicles became a uh, kind of tonic uh, to the city in motion. And so this cinematic unfolding of the facade that you just saw uh, speaks uh, in, in my reading to the building surface as a continuous wrapper around the massive urban block that you uh, see unfolding. By 1906, the store had grown from Leipziger Straße um, that you see uh, over here into the actual plot, but all this terrain that you saw up there uh, before on the map is, is the extension of, of the, the department store. So Scheffler applauded the way in which um, the continuous element creating a unified building block and uh, a the speed of the metropolis, and he saw um, uh, its uniformity as a means to stand the formlessness of the modern city. And this is also a kind of a constant tension that is that cuts across all of those three tropes of metropolitan architecture that I'm explaining, because uh, it, there's this kind of constant noia in the work where uh, the the it. On the one hand, it comes formless city uh, out of the chaos of the existing town. Um, um, the very work that then is somehow able or supposed to be able to forces of formlessness. Um, and I guess some extent, right, the sense of, 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 of a metropolitan architecture, um, this kind of paranoia. Uh, developed in buildings such as the Wertheim Warenhaus, theorized by, by figures like Scheffler and then promoted by critics like uh, Walter Kurt Behrendt, continuous facade entered architectural discourse. Uh, Behrendt uh, uh, know uh, from his 1927, um, when he at that time famously declared the victory of a new building style, little did he know, um, but um, in 1911, um, uh, he completed this dissertation that he de dedicated to Scheffler, and, and this was called The Street Wall as a Unified Spatial Element in City Building. That's 1911. And it announced the emergence of an urban architecture of large continuous surfaces that would encompass multiple individual buildings and promote the city block as a new unit for metropolitan space. What we have here is, is essentially an early definition of the superblock, where individual buildings are absorbed into a unified urban block, limited only by the four surrounding streets. And with this, a new kind of city was to form that would see individual shops consolidated into department stores and housing units amalgamate 
uh, into single urban blocks. So metropolitan architecture would, as a collective, uh, form a new architectural urbanism. And indeed, it would need a new kind of uh, architect to fully intuit um, and engage the forces of the modern city. Scheffler even outlined the characteristics of this new figure by noting that Mosul was somehow still too much an academic. Um, and he said that um, in essence, what we need is a figure that is much more impersonal and typical. Who did he think of? Uh, I don't know if he thought of, of Hilbersheimer, but the truth is Hilbersheimer thought a lot of Scheffler. Um, it's Really, uh, um, in, the, in the figure of Hilbertheimer, who seems to have taken Scheffler's call particularly seriously, that we see a development of, of, of that. Because shortly after the publication of Scheffler's book, Hilbertheimer began to meticulously study and expand on the concept of the superblock. Um, and in 1914, this is one year after uh, Scheffler writes his book, uh, the Architektur der Großstadt, the architecture of the metropolis. Um, Hilbersheimer outlines an article with the title, guess what? The architecture of the metropolis, exactly the same title, and it would take more than a decade uh, for these ideas to appear under the, the title Großstadt Architektur, um, um, that, you know, a cover of which you see on the left. We have now, um, we're now at the, the kind of the second iteration of a metropolitan architecture and what Scheffler and Behrend previously observed as a trend within the metropolis, um, um, yet unrecognized by architect was, architects was now articulated as a design approach, one that extrapolated the metropolis with the ambition to reorient it uh, from the individual towards the collective. Um, and so while the infinitely expanding grid, uh, gridded urban uniformity of the Hochhausstadt goes far beyond Scheffler's wide, wildest dreams and maybe also uh, and surely his, his wildest nightmares as well, it, it does imagine a city of urban continuity and uh, anonymity uh, and what, what previously was thought of uh, as a uh, different urban, uh, as different urban typologies of commerce, urban housing, now the ingenuity really of Hilbersheimer uh, is, was the kind of hybridization of one type that, that houses all elements of urban life. And indeed he seems to have had particular cities in mind when placing one on top of uh, the other. Um, most important for Hilbersheimer were the Berlin of Messel's department store and the Chicago uh, of Burnham and Root's Manatnock building. He admired the Manatnock slab for its unmistakable, he says, the unmistakable sense of proportion and the Wertheim store for causing innumerable variations. And so this is also very different from what you would think of a kind of the modernist uh, canon, uh, how the modernist canon would explain this, right? Uh, it's not the kind of functional assessment of, of the building, but it's the other things that uh, really speak to the way that the, the architecture uh, is, is, is kind of formed by the city and then forms the city in return. And so what we have here, uh, uh, or what um, uh, this becomes, oh no, I did this so nicely. That's all right, let's do it again, because it was fun. Um, what, what happens here is, um, it's no coincidence that the, the Manatnock uh, building uh, reappears as a slender residential tower in the Hochhausstadt and the Wertheim store as this commerce, commercial block in the lower city. Um, uh, the unornate facade of, of the Chicago building presents a kind of precursor, uh, uh, quite obvious, uh, to, to Hilbersheimer's absolute reduction and so on. So while Messel and Rood were still troubled by their inventions and couldn't quite believe what kind of monster they had created. Of course, for Hilbersheimer, that is, at least for a few years, not really uh, uh, a problem. Later on, he would then uh, call the city the necropolis and no longer the metropolis, but that is a, maybe a story for another time. Um, it's also self-evident that, that Hilbersheimer Ha had a much less hopeful image of the metropolis. Uh, but this 
foregrounding of architectural forms, in my understanding, has less to do with his uh, disdain for the metropolis than with his ambition to resituate architecture as a means for urbanism. And I was hoping to have a, a, a discussion with, with Thierry, with Pierre Vettore and Aurélie here, but I, I don't think he's here. Um, otherwise, uh, of course, he has done uh, quite a bit of work on, on that topic. Um, of, even though I think the politics that I'm associating with the work um, and, and the trajectory that I want to take the work is, is quite different uh, than, than his. Um, but but you, I'm sure all of you know his, uh, um, his reading of, of that city um, um, very well. Um, so after all, um, um, Hildesheimer uh, assessed um, architecture or saw the role of architecture in its capacity to build uh, the city. Um, this is not to say uh, that it was meant to plan the city. Um, and this becomes particularly clear in his assessment of Mises' project for the reconstruction of Alexanderplatz uh, in 1928. Here, the placement and scaling of architectural forms that configured an architectural urbanism, or as Hildesheimer notes, it attempts to give form to the plaza solely from an architectural viewpoint through individual buildings and independently of traffic lights. And so this suggests that what mattered for Hildesheimer was not the planning of the city as such, but the forming of architectural typologies that could act as urbanisms and uh, within the city. So the intensity and turmoil of the metropolis that in the first iteration of metropolitan architecture was embraced uh, seems to be now somewhat eliminated, right? The, you don't, you have very few cars and very few people in that Hildesheimerian city. And, and, and this is, of course, uh, a, a bit troubling. troubling. Um, um, and or, or, but one could also read it as uh, this being evacuated and, and evacuated into the, the urban block. Um, of course, we never see an illustration of that, and Hildesheimer never talks about it, with the exception that he he uh, looks at the lobby of, 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 of the back wall, the back wall, lobby, really, and he would talk about this level uh, 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 almost like an interior city of small shops, restaurants, and multiple services, in addition to being the connective tissue between the Zeilenbau above and the, the commercial superblock below. And one could imagine how the life of the sky lobby was to continue into the commercial block below, similarly to the way how before the city infused architecture at Wertheim, for example. But of course, this was to happen several decades later. The different uh, interior worlds that, if at all, were in the Hochhausstadt left to the imagination would appear front and center in the third iteration of a metropolitan architecture. While the term was used differently uh, in the years of high modernism and, and I think quite obviously defunct in the post-war era, it reappeared in the 1970s uh, really obviously with its early characteristics in, in the Office for Metropolitan Architecture and, and the publication of Delirious New York. And of course, Delirious New York is and, and, and the reissuing of, 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 of metropolitan architecture were timely, really, um, uh, as they responded tactically to the, to the existing fascination with the historical city as promoted by, so I'm thinking here of uh, Aldo Rossi's architecture of the city or the traditional city of, of the Piers uh, and the Stadtbaum and the popular city of Venturi and Scott Brown's Las Vegas, all happening around the same time, right? 1966, 75, and 72. And, and so, and, and the work clearly sees itself with, within that trajectory of a modern architecture where the visionary projects of, of Mises' uh, glass skyscrapers, you, you see this on the lower hand, Mendelssohn's headquarter all the way on, on top, um, and, and of course, Hildesheimer uh, in, at, at, in the central location um, um, pr presents or, or creates a kind of context in which OMA operates, right? This is uh, uh, the scheme for Hochhausstadt in a drawing they delivered uh, for the, the IBA entry, the International Building Exhibition. And 
In addition, uh, the project descri description for Kochstraße seems to quote Hilbersheimer by noting that the project should impose a, a kind of conceptual framework beyond the literalness of the street plan. Now think back to what Hilbersheimer had said about Mies. And, and later on they add Hil the, that the Hilbersheim, Hilbersheimer's parallel slabs are projected onto the narrow block number seven that uh, see where there is number three and then off to the l upper left hand side that is block number three. The I should have shown another drawing, but this area in blocks would be the way the slabs would be implemented. And, and then when, when they collide with existing structures. So Hilbersheimer's superblock became a point of reference and a model to push against the, uh, the predominant schemes of uh, urban architecture at the time. It updated the, 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 um, the Hilbersheimer block through a porous interior that, uh, um, that emulates uh, uh, the city. And so this becomes uh, even more clear in the follow-up scheme that um, Elias Angelis designed for Checkpoint Charlie, where the traffic of the city <coughs> is literally pulled through the building before it's released back into the Friedrichstraße and set on route to East Berlin. And, and this, and, and I'm here looking particularly at this kind of folded up um, axo that um, where where the cars would would uh, uh, swerve through, and and this notion of a of, of a kind of productive semi-public interior could easily be, be mistaken for the city, but in fact it's it's a I think it's a third environment that hovers between city and interior, between public and private, and and ideally uh, uh, invites a new forms of inhabitation, um, at least, you know, and, and these are probably, uh, uh, to some extent, also um, A's ambition. So by excavating both uh, the superblock urbanism of Hilversheimer and the interior climates of, down, of the downtown athletic club that you have in the middle, one gets an architecture mutation that approximates an interior urbanism and a super climate. And um, in conclusion, to me, um, the three iterations of a metropolitan architecture belong clearly to, to one project, um, namely an understanding that urbanization is almost all right. And here I really wish that Jerry Torrio was here because we would have a, a, a good discussion. Uh, um, today, um, this is uh, an attitude uh, less driven, or that, that should be an attitude less driven by the particularities of specific city where one learns from the delirium of, of New York, uh, then by recognition of, of urbanization. So the term Chicagoisms then signals an understanding of the city as an idea rather than a theorem, um, a state or condition of a city as a site of experimentation and a catalyst. Um, and that we hope, so I added to use the term as much as possible so that, that we finally get it into the dictionary. We're at the second, at the second stage um, for that eighth stage until it goes, gets to the Oxford Dictionary. But in any case, um, for, right, for this to work, architects should once again know, um, and here we go back to what I said about um, um, Sullivan and, and Root. They should know what they want uh, to have a just techniques to aim, scheme, um, uh, and uh, route, uh, or, or to paraphrase Jean-Luc Godard, don't have just ideas, he says. Don't have just ideas, have an idea, a project. Um, and this is, uh, I think, really fundamental. Um, this way, in the field, and the field being the discipline of architecture and within the city as well, might not only present us with unexpected modalities that publish norms and cliches, but should give us a vocabulary to engage the city in right, divert, or deflect its forces. The emphasis here is on engagement. Engaging the city means to up things, leaping into an existing movement uh, and proceeding through the middle, where Deleuze and Guattari remind us things pick up. Um, and so standing on the sidelines is really no longer an option since project is problematic. Um, this was not in the manuscript, I just added that. And now I have to rethink if I 
I have to retract my signature to, to broadcast that. Um, um, but by this, right, so entering uh, um, engagement is, is important. Uh, standing on the sidelines is no longer an option for us. And so the four next uh, iteration of a metropolitan architecture sacrifices for embedded criticality. It takes leaps of faith and operates from within. After all, entering the city can, for architectures of rejuvenation, even wholly transformative. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Alexander. Um, so, open it up to the audience for questions. Um, we'll pass around. Um, so, if you can put your hand up if you have any questions, we we'll appreciate that. I've, I've. I have a sort of a question more of returning to Chicago, um, and you alluded it to in, in the text where um, there's sort of now Chicago has kind of become crystallized and it no longer has potentially uh, um, the power it did um, in terms of building up a city and being for experimentation. It actually now has a precedent in itself. Um, and I wonder, uh, are there other models uh, in the world today that you're sort of looking at um, that sort of have the same characteristics um, in terms of this really rapid build um, and this kind of uh, neglect for, for a, a precedent or a history? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think they are there. Um, and, um, you know, there are in, in that trajectory of, of um, the studies that we all know so, so well, right, the, the Great Leap Forward or the Harvard project on the city and, but it also, I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm fascinated by those, but I'm also skeptical because it has become really um, fashionable to, to go out, to, to look at Ethiopia, to look at Lagos, to look at, you know, to look at Hong Kong, to look at, you, you and you draw the city and you indulge in the kind of um, um, chaos and, and, and you come back home and say, oh, this is urbanity. And, and there seems to be a kind of repetitiveness to this process where, you know, the, the, the ETH, every, like the, I, I shouldn't do that, not, not in public, but it's, you know, I think it's troubling because it, it becomes a kind of, I, I don't know if, if that any longer gives us the kind of inventiveness that, you know, that the original project sort of had. And, um, and so while I think it's uh, really productive to, to, to visit those and uh, th those cities, these, um, I'm, I'm quite bothered by, you know, yet another uh, urban project on yet another city that uh, like sort of says similar things about uh, what we already sort of um, uh, intuit. And instead, the hope would be that we finally learn, that we finally learn from it, right? That it's not just a kind of fascination and romantization of, of, of the complexity of the city, but that architecture takes away from it and sort of uh, uh, positions itself within it. Um, and I, I think those positions have to become much more radical. There's a kind of, um, kind of numbness in terms of uh, urban theory these days that is, is really quite bothersome, where sort of everybody seems to somewhat agree and, 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 and we're all doing sort of, and then what the city does is this kind of urban acupuncture and in, in cities that, that have reached a sort of uh, a, a level of beautification, the public gets really jaded and that's the hap happening in Chicago, right? That there's, there's, there isn't, there, you know, the, the, the one talks about plan turns on, 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 on sidewalks. That's the kind of urban discussion these days and it's really, it's really troublesome. And so the, the speculative project, the, 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 the radical project within architecture that has its place in the city is, 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 is needed. And I, I don't, um, yeah, there are 
there are only a very few people that do this and there are not enough. Um, so that goes all to us. I mean, if we any, any questions from the audience? this monster thing um, it's it's really fascinating to me that the uh, um, when so when when root uh, the the building the Manapnock building that I showed was was fully ornate um, then the then the client said we don't really have money for this and after all for what is it used for uh, Root gets sick before he, that he says to his craftsman okay strip it of some ornamentation uh, we will see how it looks. He comes back uh, too late to reverb anything, and the building is totally blank. And he's like, oh my god, what have I done? Um, so the, 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 the Frankensteinian monster is, is, is created where the, the architect sort of loses control, and by losing control as a kind of, uh, the, the project uh, sort of gets a certain freedom uh, from that. Uh, the same thing with Nestle's department store. Uh, these pillar systems go up, the glass in between, and and contemporary uh, uh, people have, like, you know, Behrendt, who, who was there at the moment, apparently, said that uh, he was somehow stepping back and saying, what have I done? This is This is frightening. And so again, there's this creation of an architecture where the architect loses control. And of course, then, right, famously, the Hilbertheimers also steps back from his pro project uh, a bit later and calls it a necropolis. So there is, there is a constant, um, um, maybe unawareness by the architect uh, that, that there's a certain freedom in losing control. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that's also speaking um, to to the way that the speculative project mm. should to some extent uh, w work because I think a, a, a lot of uh, practices today are still very much, and I, I guess that's a sort of um, an architect's problem, this kind of organizing and reforming mm -hmm. what, you, what you have mm. rather than sort of uh, a more playful engagement with uh, while at the same time having a clear position, I think, I, I guess to me that's the trick, but um, it's a tricky one to pull off. No questions? Okay. Yes, um, so, I mean, looking at cities like Lagos, for example, yeah. gives us the opportunity, I think, to um, be a bit detached from the actual not being involved too much in the problems to actually be able to see certain things more clear and um, I was just wondering is there like seeing the city from within could you probably like sketch out a certain kind of let's say methodology or approach how this could be done or uh, is there an idea implemented in this how this approach would actually be carried out because I see that in, in, in looking at these other cities there's there's at least the approach to be distanced from the problem and yeah. And, and also, a, a, I think that's also a really interesting a question that would be for. There's actually a potential for outsiders to look at a city that for insiders to kind of because you you see the you don't see the the forest because very few come to the city to train right and so the same thing happens with the city right if you're always if you're totally embedded. Um, And that's when I mean a, a lot of quote that was used from Kajari is the, 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 the where I think the most important thing is when they say that one has to proceed from the outside in, right? And so that then one also realizes that that this uh, that it speeds up or things speed up as one proceeds to the to the metal um, or to the center. Um, and so I mean I, I yeah I absolutely I absolutely agree. I mean and what I try to do today is to to look at uh, you know different histories um, and to, to identify certain productivities I mean the the Scheffler project I think is, is, is really fascinating because it's sort of 
it starts with deep skepticism for the, for the system. I mean, there is, there is a real, almost like a hatred of, of, of the city and, and co contemporaries to him have, have always accused him of this, that he hated Berlin. And, and so that for him presented a certain distance and then finding potentials within the problem, hence you know, my argument that you know, urbanization is almost all right. Since we got it, we might as well figure out what to do with it. Um, is is for me a productive way of, 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 of working, but it's also I mean I don't um, you know these showing these kind of historical episodes is also a way for me to avoid a formula. You know the formula in a way other institutions have figured this out. The ETH has figured out how to study every how to study every city on the globe, where, but it's totally sort of I, I yeah I mean I, I said my piece. Um, and so um, the hope would be that we, that we invent uh, um, um, multiple ways to do that. Uh, and that's when I think the, the, the position uh, of, of the, the researcher, of the architect coming in is, is, really, is really productive. Meaning if there is a kind of project that one is after, right, that, it, that one is not just uh, reacting to what one finds, but that there is a kind of hopeful vision of, of what one finds and there's a kind of hunch and, and, and an architectural project that drives it, I think that can be really, that can be really productive. And so, um, you know, if I, you know, yet another picture book on yet another city is I think not the way, the way to do it. Um, and so, I mean, for this talk, I sort of chose to look at history and to sort of, you know, unpack some, some potentials there. Right? But I, 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 you know, I think, the, the study of the city is, of course, important, right? I'm not saying one shouldn't, one shouldn't go and one shouldn't study, but I think the way one does it, um, it, it cannot well come down to kind of platitudes and kind of just yet another gazillion pictures. Um. Everybody agrees, good. Thank you very much.